Welcome to My Body, My Bump, My Baby, where we help women be empowered, intentional mothers. This podcast is best enjoyed sipping tea or taking a stroll in nature. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be substituted for professional psychological or medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, midwife, or other qualified health provider with any questions about your personal situation, health, or medical condition. Welcome to My Body, My Bump, My Baby. Today, Hannah and I are going to talk to you about bodily autonomy and being your own advocate. I'm going to say, I'm going to just start by saying this. That sounds so much freaking easier, sad, than done. (laughs) And it makes sense. I mean, think about as women, we're taught in school, like my body... My choice, if I say no, it means no. Right. Okay, well, why doesn't that apply anywhere else in the world besides sexual endeavors? It seems – so it seems like it starts to fall apart whenever we are in a position of – Um, where the other figure has some type of authority or knowledge base that we don't have. And specifically speaking, we're talking about like medical practitioners, dental practitioners, like people in those kind of worlds that actually can have an impact on our body, but we don't know a lot. We're not the trained professional in that area and we're making decisions based on, yeah, on that. I would I, say they're recommendations, but sometimes I feel like it's more than recommendations. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's an interesting point. You said um, authority figures, and then you compared them to medical professionals. And you also mentioned education levels. I, I think that education level and feeling like someone has authority over you because they have a higher, they have more letters behind their name um, is an interesting concept because I used to agree with that and I no longer agree with that at all. Well, you and I, you and I were recently, we were having a little bit of a text chat about this, you know, back in the day. So this is where we're going to have like our generational age differences kind of shine back in the day. You kind of did just do whatever the doctor said because there was really – there was not easy access to information for you to do a whole lot of your research. The only way you can do research was going to a library and getting data out of a, a published book. Well, you know, as the moment it's published, it's out of date. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we're today, we're in this world where information is moving at the speed of – that it's created, that we are determining these things. And all we have to do is go out there and look and get the research and and educate ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it goes both ways. Keeping up with that information is tough. It takes time. It takes energy. And think about these practitioners out here who have been schooled in one thing, and then they see patients back to back to back every 15 minutes for appointments throughout the day. Where is their time to continue to increase their knowledge and improve their breadth of information coming in? Do you know this is a good question? I, you actually are married to somebody who's in the medical field. When, when, like as a midwife assistant and a doula, um, in order to maintain my credential, I was required to take continuing education credits every year. Do they do that same yeah. thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, they absolutely have to. But I, And I can't speak to how many continuing education credits it is. And same with, like, I mean, I also grew up with a dentist. I was a dentist's daughter. And so same thing with my mother. Um, but it all depends also on your schedule. What can you take? What's available? What's cost effective for you to take? And there are easy ways to get those credits versus if you want to make an investment in your knowledge and travel somewhere that maybe something is being offered that you are like truly interested in versus just taking something online just to make sure that you fulfill those requirements. There's well, a difference. and I guess, I guess we could also think about it this way as well. Like, you know, if say for example, you are a gynecologist, um, 
It doesn't necessarily mean that the continuing education Correct. credits are going to be in your field. It also doesn't mean that it's going to be the cutting edge stuff. So I, you know, I think the point is that, you know, there's a high probability that a lot of practitioners spend a lot of their time practicing medicine. And when they're not practicing medicine, they're tired mm-hmm. and they're not doing this research. No, who wants to go and then take a be working with patients every 15 minutes from 8 to 5 and in, in, during the day, maybe with a lunch break, and then Monday through Friday, and then leave for a weekend or take an entire weekend, another 10 hours each day, to go do, like, to go travel somewhere to go see something. Yeah, that's just not a thing. No. So when we're talking about being your own advocate, we are talking about today when it is related to your body and your health. And we're talking about making decisions that are informed and they're based on our acronym that we introduced several episodes in the past called BRAIN. So what are the benefits? What are the risks? What are the alternatives? What does your intuition say? Or what happens if you just do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Versus getting... um, Either making a decision based on fear, making an uneducated decision, or be making a decision because you're being bullied and you just want it to stop. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, both B and I have stories, personal stories related to this, and they might—they're not necessarily related to the birth space, but like our own specific stories. But um, I think that they're very powerful to share to give an example of what it is that we are truly speaking to. I want to start with bees yeah, specifically, so and maybe we'll get into mine later. This this came up for me um, quite recently. I um, I when I was flossing, I was noticing something funny with one of my teeth, and I, I'm like, maybe I was thinking, well, it feels like there's like movement. Um, that's weird, right? So I went to the dentist and I let her know and she took a look and she's like, oh, it looks like this um, this filling that you've had for a while is loose and needs to be replaced. I'm like, cool, let's just replace it. And she's like, well, you know, let's take a look. We're going to do some x-rays and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh yeah, that's a pretty, it's a pretty deep filling. And what that means is you need a root canal. And for me, all of the, so root canal and B are not two things that are going to coexist. <laughs> so all of my like alarms went off and all the whistles were like, wah, 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 wah. First thing I'm thinking is like, hold on. Why, why do I need a root canal? Because I thought I just needed like a filling replaced. Like I'm not in any pain. I actually don't have any sensitivity. So I don't, like that says to me, I'm not a dentist, but that says to me, Root is healthy. <laughs> Why are we going to pour acid in it and pull it out? <laughs> like I do, canal. Right? I don't understand that. Um, and so I ended up, so I went into that appointment um, to have this, you know, taken care of. I ended up staying there for an hour and a half. And to have it, your filling taken care of, to confirm. Yeah. It's, it, you was not getting a root canal taken care of. Mm-mm. No. Yeah. So I ended up staying there an hour and a half and nothing was done to my tooth. The entire hour and a half was the dentist just kind of lecturing me. And I don't want to use the word badgering, but I feel like it's a good description. Because I, the reason I don't want to use the word badgering is because I do think she had my best interests at heart. And she really was trying to convince me of what she thought was mm. best for me. But she and I were not on the same page. My My what I want for my health and my body was not lining up with whatever her medical experience was. And that was challenging, man. That was super, super hard because, you know, it, I've heard a lot of stories like this, but sometimes these professionals, because this is what they do all of the time and I don't, and I don't have that degree, they can be little like, and make you sound like, why are you acting like an idiot? This is silly stuff. You know, what is wrong with you? And you're just like, oh my God. I literally started crying in that chair. It was so darn intense. And finally, the way I got out of it was, um, I just started to agree with her. And I was like, yep, yep. We're going to do all the things, all the things, all the things you want to do, we're going to do them. Um, 
And um, I, I said, We're, I can't do it today because I didn't plan for this, right? Um, but we'll, I'll just make some appointments and we'll do them. And I just got out of there. <laughs> I'm sitting over here laughing internally <laughs> because you just basically were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, get going along with the flow. But it was an hour. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just like, first I did advocate for myself. And then I was told I'm an idiot. And then we kept going on and on and on. And an hour down the road, I'm like, I am beat up. I'm beat up. I got like, (laughs) my eyes are, you know, like if this was like a physical match, man, I would have been like, cut me. I can't see no more. Cut me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because I felt like I couldn't see. I couldn't see clearly anymore. I was so darn emotional. And I'm like, I don't feel like I can make a good decision right now because I don't know what to do anymore because I'm so emotional about this. But by by choosing to be like, okay, we'll do this later and just start agreeing. (laughs) You essentially were also doing nothing in that moment. I did nothing. I I did nothing. I bought myself a way out of an intense situation and I created space for myself. And that's really what I needed. I needed space um, because one, I wasn't prepared to make that decision right there. Um, I needed to go and do some research and I needed to check in with my intuition and see how I felt about it. And I also needed space to like come down from this high emotional place that I had been put in <laughs> all of this over a tooth. Could you imagine if it was over a baby? Holy crap. That's so much harder. <laughs> mm-hmm. But in the moment, a tooth is a big thing too. I, I mean, mean, it's a piece of my body. body. Yeah. I it's mean, your that, body. You might as well have just said... Hmm, your you know your nail is funny on your pinky. Oh, you're gonna have to cut off your finger. You know what I mean? That's like for me, How that's like felt. the same thing. I'm like, oh my god, what do you mean? I gotta cut off my finger? <laughs> I don't want to cut off my finger. So what did you end up doing? Um, I did a ton of research. I effectively tried to become an expert on endodontists and the procedures and the latest technology and what was available. And you know what I found? I found that there were some endodontists um, that were doing some cutting edge things where they were actually focusing on trying to save teeth and regenerate teeth rather than killing them and leaving them dead in the body. Um, And so what I did is I went to a local endodontist who I did a little research and found out they had all of the latest technology that I needed to do a particular procedure that I had seen um, another endodontist show on a YouTube video. I took her this YouTube video and I was like, okay, here's what's going on. As soon as I sat in the chair, her assistant's like, oh, you're going to need a root canal. I'm like, oh, this is not a good start, right? The new yeah, one that you want to do? Yeah, as soon okay. as I sat down. But then the dentist came in and she was, all right, y'all, I'm a little bit older. The endodontist? The came endodontist in? Okay. came in. This little, this girl was like 12. Like she was so young. I'm like, oh, okay. It turned out to be a good thing for me because she was young. She was probably very new at her job, but she was very open-minded still. And so I was like, here's what I would like to do. I showed her the video of this procedure and she looked at it and she was like, oh yeah, I, I see where she's going with that. Yeah, let's try it. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, she had never seen it before. She'd never done it before. So I'm actually educating her a little bit in that moment. And that was my tool to speak her language for what I wanted. And it worked out. It worked out. Actually, I got the the filling removed and replaced. And I still have my root intact and is a live tooth. Do you think that that's impactful on her? Like, Gosh, did she darn, I hope so. It? No. Oh, darn. I would follow <laughs> up. I would just want to know. That's so cool, though. So you took it in your own power to make an informed decision because it's your body. Yeah. And what you did. And lucky for me, I had the space for time. I actually, it took me about two weeks. So I, you know, I'm like heavily doing research and trying to figure things out. So it did take me some time. And luckily, my body had the space for that time. Um, but the end result was so worth it. So worth it. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, so cool because this just goes back to anyone when, and I'm saying you, but, or not you be, but just you in general, like when you're confronted with a medical issue, the question you can ask is, do you respond with fear 
or do you give away your locus of control? And in this, like in this setting, not or do you, um, or do you become a seeker or researcher? So in this setting, you became the seeker and researcher, and you made the right decision based on what it was for you. Well, let me tell you something. Here's the thing: when it comes to your physical body and your health, you really are the person that has to be responsible. You may not be the person that has all of the information and all of the knowledge on that thing, but you have to be the person making an informed decision because in the end, you're the only one living with the results of that. Absolutely. I I think about like providers, they see hundreds to thousands of people each year and you are the only one that truly owns your own specific health. You are not a number to yourself. You are a number in a system. We have social security numbers, right? For goodness sakes, right? And not even and, and like this is tough to say sometimes, but not even your spouse or your partner um, gets as close to you as you are to your own 100%. body because they don't have your intuition right. at all, right? And so you're the only one that's going to truly live with the outcome of whatever decision it is that you make. Hundred yeah. percent. You have to remember your body is your most valuable asset in this life. You can't be here without it, right? And so you really do have to maintain it and take care of it and make decisions that are going to work for you in the end. Mm -hmm. So when you're making a decision for your body, the most important asset in your life, and that means physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, that's, that's all your body in one, right? Uh, you also have to think about it as how impactful it is in the decisions you're making for your children yes, as well. Yes, right. They depend on you. Yeah, and you're teaching with every single little thing you do. We know right. that from our language, from like how we are speaking to them. Right. But same with the decisions we make for our own health. Like we're teaching our children what's right and what's wrong. Gosh, this is, you know what? A story just came up for me. It's not my story. It's my husband's and I'm going to share it. So I hope he doesn't get angry with me, but here's a good, here's a good example of that. Um, my husband's father, he actually had heart disease very young. I think he had a, like a heart attack in his forties, like his mid forties. That's super early. And he died, um, of heart failure. I believe it was at 56, I'm telling you what, this this has painted the life for my husband. Like most decisions he makes always go back to his dad and his dad's health. I mean, and he'll talk about like his dad's eating habits. He'll talk about his dad smoking. He'll talk about his dad drinking. He'll talk about his dad lack of exercising. Everything my husband does revolving his not only his physical body, but honestly, our family choices have revolved about his dad's health. It's huge. Mm-hmm. Huge. It is huge. And I don't think we often recognize that from a parental level, mm-hmm. um, looking down to our, not looking down, but like sweeping that on our children. Mm-hmm. But our children are seeing it looking up at us. 100%. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. And... Um, as parents, we're their our children's health and their physical and their mental and emotional development is the response is our responsibility as parents, right? To provide for them what we want them to see later on in life, right? And be able to come into their own autonomy. It's like this: lessons come in a lot of forms, right? Lessons are not just verbal communications that we sit down and intentionally have. Lessons are being offered at all times. As, as long as your child is around you watching, watching you, they are learning from you. Oh, yeah. And I want my child to be a problem solver when it comes to the – or my children to be problem solvers when it comes to this um, and their, their health. And I want them to be able to solve a lot of the challenges that they might – or that they might come across – I do not want my children to be followers. And that's all that we ever learn is lead, don't follow. Yes. But we never talk about that in the health space. Right. Oh, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. We learn to lead, don't follow. But in the health space, often we're following. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And allopathic medical training um, has its time and its place. And we'll talk about that. But it provides a diagnosis and a treatment for a condition. So if someone's diagnosed with something like multiple sclerosis, it then provides a treatment for that condition. 
it doesn't provide a treatment for that whole person. Right. So it's an ailment. And they're just saying, how do I fix this ailment? If they could take the ailment out and put it in a Petri dish, that's really more of how they're working. They're not working with the whole body, the whole person. Mm -hmm. When I say whole body, I mean physical body, emotional body, spiritual body. They're not Mm -hmm. working with all of that. They literally are taking a physical symptom, throwing it in a Petri dish and be like, how do I fix this thing? Mm -hmm. And, And that's like traditional allopathic, like conventional medicine. Um, functional medicine actually does pull it out into like the sp- and naturopathic medicine pulls it out into like the spiritual mental state of the the person, which I think is really cool. But they still also put it back onto the patient. Like a good practitioner is going to put it back onto the patient to say, "Here's some information and data coming in." What are you going to do about it? And like, how can I support you in, in healing on this journey? Here's, here's one of the things that you do with your um, clients that I, that I just, I think this is so big. It's such a big deal. You do this like full intake where you go all the way back to their birth and you are trying to capture an image of this person's story yeah. because all of those details matter, right? Like you can have something that's going on with you today, but that's something that is going on with you today could have literally started 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and just been slowly, slowly growing, growing. I think that we're so, we're in this high technology, instant gratification world here in the United States that we always just look to the left about 20 minutes and be like, oh, it's probably that. Right. And that's just not how the body works. Mm -mm. Right. Like you and I are both gardeners. You have a plant. The plant is doing good, doing good, doing good, doing good. One day you go out, the plant is like half dead. You're like, what happened? You think, oh, maybe there was a freeze last night. Maybe something happened to or, you know, a bug got on it. But maybe, maybe way back when months and months and months ago, when you planted it, the soil was poor. And it's just barely been getting by this whole time. And finally, after several months, it's like, I'm done. (laughs) I can't. I can't grow anymore. I can't thrive. I can't do anything, right? The body is similar. Yeah. And that happens in farming, like, all of the time. And that's why they have to move to a different field. Or, well, they should be moving to a different field. But, yes. Yeah. Um, In homeopathy, there's actually – there's three laws of cure. They're called Herring's Law of Cure. And they take into account – essentially like looking back into someone's history like that. And it's kind of, it's a second law, I believe. And it's pulling back the roots. Uh, it's almost like peeling an onion Yeah. from like, where did this happen with someone? And I've experienced this myself in some of my healing. And it's, it's also like that in emotional and spiritual healing too. Yes. Oftentimes things will pop up from like even your own birth that yeah. you didn't know or impacting you in a mental and emotional or even physical way still. It's really cool. Or sometimes there's things that we are like in our past, our, our youth that we don't even remember, but mm-hmm. they are impact us, impacting us in a physical way. We have to remember, you know, the the emotional body is attached to the spiritual body is attached to the physical body. You ever done yoga and you did a heart opener and all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> and you just breathe. start cr- yeah, crying, crying, right? That is an emotional release out of the physical body. Right. Mm-hmm. It's huge it because, because something had been trapped there and it needed to come out. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, and yeah. I could go on for stories about that with my throat, <laughs> with my throat chakra. <laughs> um, and so overall, sometimes uh, when we are individuals out in society and not even – this goes back to the leading following aspect or idea – Sometimes, especially in the medical space, it's easier to do what we are told to do. Oh, my gosh. It goes quicker. You get it done. You get the satisfaction. Not the satisfaction. You get the immediate set gratification, but it might not be what you need. Right. I mean, this this whole thing about self-advocating is super – it's hard, folks. I'm just going to be honest. Like, it's super challenging. Even as a doula, I cannot tell you how many times – um, you know, we have sat in prenatals and my clients have been very clear about what they want. And then we get into that situation and they, they just kind of do everything the opposite of what they desired. Like they just kind of get pulled along this 
road that is completely different than what they wanted. And I can think of a lot of reasons why this might happen. You know, one, fear. Mm -hmm. Like Like you said, baby, you put another life into it that you haven't even met yet. And, and, and I'm, I'm not a doctor. So how do I know, you know, what the right choice is? The doctor knows what the right choice is. You know, when you're talking about like, is my baby going to be okay? And, and uh, sometimes I will say words are used to toy with our emotions to get us to make certain decisions. For the example, like this whole scenario with the dentist, you know, she used belittling, triggering phrases to me that I had to have in that moment, I had to have, um, like, do I take this as an agreement? Is, is this me or, or is it not me? And it's really hard when somebody's saying, this is you, this is what's happening with you. This is why you're here. This is why you failed. This is why you're broken. This is why this is happening. And you're like, Oh crap. Right. See, this happens a lot. I, I hate to say it, but it does happen a lot. Yeah. In these type of situations. I, I completely agree with it. I think that they're almost giving you the opposite side of informed consent in this. So It's confrontation. Like I'm guessing death of tooth was used. Death the word of tooth. death is yeah. used. So imagine being you being having the word of death being used in a pregnancy setting. That's if- scary. If I was okay. pregnant and somebody said they don't even have to use the word death. If they said my baby is not okay, mm-hmm. I I would do whatever. Most women will do mm-hmm. whatever. That's the part that's not very fair. You know the way words yes, are being used. The way the words are being used. However, <laughs> that's where it takes a lot of backbone and a lot uh, just confidence to question that. Question it. Just step back and just, say why. Yes, and ask for the data. Yes. Because that that might be a, a 0.2%. Yes. And this is this always gets me because it, it uh, not always gets me. It's interesting to me because then turning this around into the opposite spectrum, baby's here and they're giving your child a specific vaccine and they don't tell you that death is one of the side effects. Yes, right. So why is it okay to use fear in one space but not use fear in another? Right. That comes up to me, like mm-hmm. comes up for me a lot. Right. It just doesn't feel truly informed. And the right. only way that I have ever been informed is doing the research on my own. Which means, again, we talk about this a lot in this podcast, but I don't know that – can you ever talk about this too much? You just have to do – you have to do your research before the event. Yes. Like get ahead of the game, know what you want before you get there. Yeah. And it can be – here's the thing. That sounds exhausting. Yeah, it does. And it is tiring. However, that's parenthood for you. That is advocating for your own body. I, that's what the podcast is. My body, my baby. Mm-hmm. It it's truly um, being the advocate for yourself. 100%. And there are other reasons too. So, like the fear piece of it, the feeling of being bullied, that that like hits people really hard. It's hit me, and yeah. it takes a while. Like it, so, like it takes a while to get used to it and to have to grow that backbone. Um, and I think that my friends and I were actually like, a group of women and I were talking about this recently. Um, I think it takes a catalytic catalytic event, some type of catalytic event in your life life, to truly, to keep growing that backbone. Heck yeah. So you building even these like little experiences like B of the dental event is a big, was a catalyst for you because when we started really my talking about My catalytic event was my liver issue. Yeah. That was it. That changed that everything for me. That was your big, like, okay, shift from left to right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You you had a catalytic yeah, event. Yeah, my catalytic, catalytic event was being diagnosed with multiple sclero- sclerosis. Right. Um, but I've also had other catalytic events of, like, birthing my child or mm-hmm. then being spoken to in different ways from different professional or, or practitioners and saying, like, hold up that are stoking the fire yeah Yeah. 
And and just and having little seeds planted to yeah. say this doesn't make sense right. necessarily to me. Right. And and in most of my clients, and this would be more so like with cl- oh, in general clients, I guess. Oftentimes, most of them have had some type of catalytic catalytic event that have brought them to me. Mm. And um, I find that extremely interesting because it does impact where you are in a stage of change and whether you're ready to for change yes. or not for change. Yes. But I, uh, I just, I just can only imagine a world where people were ready for that change before they had some type of event, like health event, that just made them change. Like, what if they never had that? That would be amazing. Their bodies would be so strong, and they wouldn't have to go through all of this. That would be fantastic. But I do think that not, we just need to have an awakening. Yeah, it's an awakening. Yeah, you, you yeah. just have to have that experience. And so I work with a lot of mamas, so a lot of times their catalytic events are pregnancy or infertility challenges, like challenges with fertility. I don't like to call it infertility. Challenges with fertility or birth experiences, too. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that that's the event that is causing them to wake up no. though. <laughs> but, no, no, no. But it, it is a thing. That's why that, well, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about these things mm-hmm. be- because of this, right? I want to talk to, I want to talk to really the first time mom, you know, I feel like for many, not all, um, but for many first time moms, um, a lot of you have not been in a place where you have had to advocate for your body because usually you're young, usually you're point. healthy, right? Um, so like sometimes pregnancy is the very first time you're coming into this place where you're like, oh, oh, wait, what's happening? I have to advocate for myself. And do be careful. There is a system and it's very easy, especially if you're like the A student or the rule follower or like you just always want to do everything right, the perfectionist, right? So I'm kind of throwing out some like personas. Yep. If this sounds like you, you need to be extra vigilant because it's very easy to get caught up in the system telling you what to do and not take a step back and check in with yourself and find out like, wait a minute, does that actually work for me mm-hmm. personally? Does that feel right for me? Does that feel right for my baby? And just a simple question of if you are told to do something, you don't have to say this out loud. Like you can back off and do nothing for a moment, mm-hmm. but you can ask why to yourself and mm-hmm. then you can go do the research for why. Mm-hmm. And each time that why is going to help you dig a little deeper into your own research and then dig a little deeper into your own tu- intuition right? around something. Right. And sometimes I'm going to say this. Sometimes we don't have like, you know, there's just some people who are just so quick-witted, right? Like they always know the thing to say and you're like, dang, you're so clever. I wish I could be like, mm, 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 like that. I'm not. I'm not that person. Me neither. So sometimes I think what happens is you can be confronted with a situation where you're trying to make a decision and maybe you just kind of do go with whatever you're told and then you walk out of there and you're driving home and you're going over this thing in your head and then you're like, uh, what the hell did I just sign up for? Wait a minute. Like, wait, what? Wait, does this make sense to me? And the more you think about it, the more you think about it, the more, the more you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I will say I've had a lot of mamas who have signed up for a elective induction. And usually those are like, they schedule them like three to seven days in advance, right? And then they start to think like, wait a minute, wait a minute, do I want this? This doesn't feel right. I don't think I'm comfortable with this. And um, here's the thing. If you sign up for something and you have that moment where you're like, wait, this is not feeling right. And you do your research and you spend some time checking in with yourself and you decide, yeah, for sure, I do believe this is not right for me. Um, you don't have to show up. Mm-hmm. You can always cancel something too. Yeah. Just don't show. Just cancel. Mm-hmm. Just be like, ah, sorry, I'm going to cancel that appointment. <laughs> and again, it's very likely it, they're not going to call you back. It does happen oftentimes until they start going through their schedule for the day. Like, wait, I thought this. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. Right. And it's one of the reasons it's very interesting because when you were in that appointment, it was a very important thing. And then when you cancel the appointment, somehow the importance of this thing has faded away. 
Mm-hmm. Like not enough for them to call you back, not enough for them to reschedule. They're like, oh, okay, bye. Yeah, but you use a, num- <laughs> num- a number yeah. again in yeah. that versus like the human being making that decision. <laughs> the I think that that does kind of speak to looking at how doctors are oftentimes seen as a maternal or a maternal as a paternal figure. And so medical professionals, like, they make a declaration, like a paternal declaration, and then you follow that declaration. Yes. And then you step back, you're like, wait, why did I just agree to that? Right. It's it's like you almost, when you get in that situation with, with people that know, have like a different education, and they know so much more about this particular topic than you do, it's like you turn into a child. Yeah. It's like you go back, you regress. Now you're in this parent-child relationship yeah. with this person, and then you're like, wait a minute, I am an adult. I am not a child. What are mm-hmm. we doing here? And I think this is as you progress in your in raising children too. In the beginning, you start you listen to everything, and you might agree to things. And it, it, I mean, it's taken me years. I, I would still agree to something, and then I'd leave and be like, wait, why am I going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I just spend money on those supplements? That makes zero sense. Gosh Hannah. darn it. And yeah, and so it's just again, but it just reiterated it has reiterated to me of like, Hannah, don't make a decision in the moment like that. No. Just step back and what yeah. is your gut saying? Right. Around it too. And and my husband now asks me, like, what does your gut say about it? When yes. it comes to my son and myself, I guess. But it's it's just one of those things. Um and you just have to recognize that your best – and we've said this many times, but your best interest is your best interest. It's not the doctor's best interest. It's not necessarily even your partner or spouse's best interest. Like it's it's you making that decision for yourself. There is a caveat here, and I want to talk about this with allopathic medicine um, and our – west or what we call like Western medicine. Emergency medicine, really in-depth cases – it has a time and a place, and, and that's what it's for. And, and in the moment when you have an emergency, you don't have the time to do all of that research. And you're likely going to the ER. You're making these decisions. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize what is an emergency for you or in your family and what isn't and where you can train your own brain up in the knowledge right. versus right. rely on someone else's knowledge as well. Here's another thought um, that Hannah and I were, you know, really just pondering as we were preparing for this episode. Um, yes, yes, the the practitioner, the medical practitioner does have the degree and the experience. But one thing we have to step back and ask, and this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, who is more up to date on the science and the research? Is it you? Or is it your provider? And, it, it, and this is the science research for you as an individual. Right. It's going to be you. Yeah. And we talked about this in the very beginning. So I think it's great that we're coming back around to it. it it's always going to be you. Um, you, and going back to like letters behind a name, like you do not have to have letters behind your name to be doing more research and know more of what fits you in the current science you believe that fits you than what your doctor is telling you. In the end, you are the utmost authority, knowledgeable person about you. Yeah. Nobody else. Nobody yeah. has a degree in you but you. How old are you? You're 30 some odd years old. I have been practicing Hannah for 30 some odd years. Can anybody else in the world say that? No, no. ma'am. No. No. <laughs> no. And even, I mean, my husband says this and working in, like, he works in allopathic medicine. And what do we do at our house? Who do we listen to and who do we look to for a healing perspective and health perspective at our house? It's me. I'm right. doing all of the research on everything. <laughs> and, I mean, the man doesn't take allopathic medicine he uses everything that i recommend that is so funny versus that that is so funny it is it is really funny and when people come to him outside of work that he typically says i'm going to talk to hannah <laughs> i'm like okay <laughs> because there's a lot that we like when you are in like looking at allopathy too and you're looking at um thing like i mean you know you have a headache what do you do take advil or Motrin. why right. is someone going to Tony for that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So going full circle, and we talk about this so often, I want to make sure that we touch on it again because I think it's so important and critical um, in our lives. But full circle back to BRAIN, the acronym. Right. Um, B-R-A-I-N literally spells BRAIN. And um, it's the acronym that stands for Benefits, Risks, Alternatives, Intuition, and Doing Nothing, which is oftentimes one of the most key critical things, important things I can – come up with but b taught me this and um some of it it just makes sense talking about i mean just bringing it up like benefits okay do your own research what are the benefits to the decision that you're making and here's the thing if you're in a situation where you got caught off guard so my story about going to the dentist that you know i got caught off guard they're asking me to make a decision about something that i i just really didn't expect that day i thought i was going to get a filling Right. And now I'm talking about this whole different invasive procedure. And I was just like really caught off guard. If you're caught off guard and you're sitting there like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Then the thing to do is get out of there and do nothing so that you have space to do your research. So benefits, do your research. If you haven't had time to do your research, find space to do your research. Yes. And and that oftentimes means doing nothing in the acute moment. So that goes back to the end of saying like, like you said, oh, sure, right. I'll do this. I'll schedule right. this appointment. I'll schedule that induction. Go home. Do it. Oh, never mind. Cancel. Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Looks like there's an online scheduling tool. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, and then that's also doing the research on the risks. Yes. And that those often, so they're given to us, like I mentioned again, like they're given to us. Sometimes they're given, they're not giving to us other times. Right. And I think a lot of times it's they're given to us in a fear-based setting for right. whatever it is that paternal decision wants you to make or paternal figure wants you to make. Right. Um, so make space again to do your own research right. on this. And what does your gut feeling tell you in the moment? And then step back and give yourself space to see what is your gut feeling saying when you leave. Going back to risks, okay. the word risk is scary. Usually oh, yeah. it has scary things in it. So also, here's the thing. Be careful when you're doing your research with risks. If you find that it's just a list, you know, here are the risks. Um, You know, you can hemorrhage, you can get an infection, you can die. So that's like, ha, holy crap, that's scary, right? Okay, what is the probability that you're going to hemorrhage? What is the probability of getting an infection. What is the probability of death? Now put it in context, right? So like if you're reading these risks and then you start feeling a lot of emotion in your body and you can feel your body reacting to that, then this is not the time to make a decision. That is the time to go in and dig deeper. You need to make a decision that is not fueled by really high charged emotions. You need to be able to feel confident. And when you're making your decision, if you're not feeling confident, but you're feeling like, ah, then you haven't done enough research. No. <laughs> yeah. And that oh, feeling is going to translate over past the decision that you made too. It's fight or flight. Yes. That feeling and you're saying, is you're either going to run away or you're just going to be like, ah, make a stop. <laughs> and therefore you are again sitting in your sympathetic nervous system, which is not healthy for anyone. Right. Yeah, right. We already do that in, in way too much, way too much. Yeah. Right. Then where we should be. So by taking, making that space for yourself too, and doing that research, you can bring yourself into a parasympathetic state and then listen to what your intuition is saying, because you have to truly be connected in that state in a parasympathetic state, which is the the rest and relax, to be able to listen to what your gut is saying. Yes. For you. Now, if you've been provided with maybe one choice, my choice in my story was you have to have a root canal. And I just, no matter how I did the, I looked at all the information, I just know there's no way I was comfortable with it. I did feel like I was an animal backed in a corner and I didn't have any choices. And so this is where you come up with alternatives. Start looking for other options. And I will be honest, sometimes there are some very obvious other options. As soon as you start looking, you're like, oh my God, why didn't they tell me this? Why didn't they tell me that? Why didn't they tell me this? And then sometimes there are like very much less obvious options. In my case, 
nobody was doing this. I literally found one endodontist in California who was doing this. So like she was at the cutting edge and I'm so grateful that she did videos on these things so that I was able to get that information. But sometimes it's going to be like very rare, but it might feel right for you. It might, you know, you might have with, when you check with your intuition, you're like, yes, that yes, makes sense. This is it. This is the thing. Even though it's probably pretty rare and not a lot of people have done it, it doesn't, it's okay, right? It's fine. If that feels right for you, then that's what you bring up with your provider next time you see them. Like, wait, what about this option? Yeah. And I, hmm, that sparks a story on my end too. I love the like bringing it up with your provider too, because then you can also gauge their ability to be open as a provider too. And to are they the right that's... person? Tell that story. Yeah. I know you're got, what yeah. story you're so, talking about. You got to tell it. Yeah. So my story was related to, so I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in like in 2019. And um, for me, medication didn't make an immediate sense. Um, it just didn't sit with me well. So similar to B's experience, I'm like, what? okay, I started digging into other things and looking into other, other alternatives. Um, and one of the things that I was looking into was like the medication that they were recommending and, you know, like a 30% success rate, blah, 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 blah. And 30% so, is really low. It is. Let me it just is low. highlight that. <laughs> it is low because you still need the lifestyle interventions. Right. Yeah. You still need the lifestyle interventions in order to truly make a change. And, and especially with this medication, I mean, I started digging into what was in it. So outside of the adjuvants that was in it, um, it was made, made primarily out of amino acids. And I know, and I, I was very basic in my health training at this point in time, but I know like amino acids are coming from things like meat-based things. I can get them from, or like and plants and all that type of stuff. But a true amino acid profile I can get from eating a steak. Um, and so I started digging and taking supplements. So I started digging and I did the math. I went back to like figuring out how to mathematically um, break down how much I would need to ingest in order to equal what the intravenous dose was going into my body. Um, and I took it very far. And I brought <laughs> this in <laughs> to the neurologist who I was new to seeing. And I presented it to him and I said, why can't I just eat the food? Why can't I just take the supplements? What was the response? It was blank. Like, like he, he very much was like. Just didn't know what to do with it? Yeah. And kind of looked at me like I don't like using the word crazy isn't the right thing. But using the word of like he probably was like that's not a bad point in his head. <laughs> it probably did start the wheels uh-huh. turning. But he also was seeing me for 20 minutes and then he was going to the next person for 20 minutes right and so he moved on to the next topic of conversation and I didn't end up going home and taking that at that time at all but it did create a um it it created something for me seeing his reaction to that Um. where I recognized hey I have the power to make these decisions for myself and I have the power to come across this knowledge for myself and why I'm not going to listen to just what someone tells me to do in any type of way. I mean, here's the thing when we're talking about advocating for yourself and we're talking about doing your research and checking in with your intuition and looking for alternatives. the, The reality is that, you know, your doctor moves on. Like I'm just going to say, you walk out that door, they have forgotten you because they really don't know you in the first place, right? You walk out the door, they've forgotten you. What happens to you? They don't know. They don't re- It's not something they think about or ponder or any of those things because they just don't have the time or the space to do it. So please be clear. I'm not saying they're bad humans. They just don't have the time or the space for it. And the volume, the sheer volume that they are in charge of, you know, people that they try to keep healthy, there's just, it's almost impossible for them to do and so the only way your your provider knows who you are is is right before they walk into the room they look at your chart and they get a reminder about what's going on with you and they're like oh okay well this is what you do right and so this is why advocating for yourself is so important because when you walk out the door 
You live with it for the rest of your life. Their job is to tell you what they know. Right. Their job is not to make the decision for you to do something. Right. That's your job. That is your job. Mm -hmm. Well put. It's your job to do Yes. That. Um, and so going back to your intuition, I mean, finding a way to connect with it is incredibly important. This, in this is setting. huge. Especially, like, let's go to pregnancy here. This is hard to do when you are in your mama mind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the mama mind, she's, she is crazy about her baby. That's just what it is, right? And so sometimes I feel like it's hard to see clear. It's hard to see through it. it you, you almost get into this very like um, like life or death panicky place where like this is my baby, right? Like how do I how do I step back and connect with my intuition? Because we're in so much like oh my God, my baby, that it's almost impossible to do in some cases for some people. Um, I would say this, remember, remember this. You are the only person in the world physically connected to this little human. You also spend more time than anybody in the world with this little person. They are with you 24-7. And I know you can't see them. And for some mamas, maybe you can't feel them just yet. Um, but I will say that their little personality, what they need, is shining through your body. You are experiencing it. You are feeling it. And you can know it. You just have to find your trust in those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, this brings up another great thing with intuition um, specifically. And I I think there's a difference between our – there not I think. There is a difference between your thoughts and the visceral feeling of intuition and oh, intuitive yes. nature in your body. Oh, yes. Um, one of my friends was sharing and, – and I've had these feelings too. So I can speak to it from like my perspective too. Like the feeling that you get of – there's something is something wrong with my baby yes um because they're, they're in you like yes and i think i maybe i lost my baby like i i think i like there's something wrong with my baby so the first question that i would ask that person is is that a thought in your head like is that something that you are thinking or is that something that you are truly, deeply, viscerally feeling? Feeling. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot say that you're truly, deeply, viscerally feeling that or you're not connected to that, it's a thought. Right. Mm -hmm. I think a mother that's connected to their intuition when they step back and truly connect like what B was talking about, you know when something's wrong. You do know. Yeah. You do know. And also just remember that. Yeah. Remember your knowing. Yeah. When there is a knowing, this, this, so this is not fueled by just the mental chatter of fear and panic, but when there is a true knowing, girl, listen to that. I can tell, I have like so many stories of mamas who had these moments where they're like, something's not right. Like they knew in their bones, something's not right. They went to, they go to the doctor, the doctor's looking at the baby and they're like, the baby's fine. And they're like, nope, something's not right. Baby's fine. Nope, something's not right. Literally 30 minutes later, baby crashes. Like they knew, like mm -hmm. they knew. And and those knowings can save lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I like for me personally, I think that's why I feel so confident. Uh, like, that's not why I feel. That's one of the reasons why I feel very confident in my um, choices I've made throughout this pregnancy of how like – when to treat, not to treat, et cetera. Right. And like ha when to explore something, not to explore something because I have put so much and I've, I've gained so much trust in my own body mm -hmm. and my baby to be able to make those decisions that I know that I will know. Yes. Like I know. And if I say I know that I need to go to a hospital or I know that I need to do an ultrasound or something like that, then there's a problem. Like that means that I know. Right. So. Right. Right. And one more thing to say about intuition. Um, it, it, intuition, I would say, is an extension of our body. So intuition can get hurt or get broken, right? So uh, a mama who has many losses under her belt, she's working oh, yeah. with a 
a hurt intuition. Absolutely. So for those mamas, um, it is okay. Everything you're feeling is okay. Everything you're feeling is normal. And for you, maybe intuition is not the most healthy thing in that moment. And you can take steps to grow that intuition as you go along. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. In our ultrasound studio, we see a lot of IVF families um, who maybe have tried and tried and tried and tried and had a lot of unsuccessful takes and their intuition is bruised, swollen, beat up, and bleeding. Like, it's just not happening yep. for them. And so for them, they're taking those little baby steps to heal their intuition. So little things like, you know, I'm going to come in and do a quick little ultrasound and check in on my baby. That is a healing step to fixing intuition yeah. hurts. Absolutely. And, like, and I've seen my intuition only, like, I've healed my intuition yes. through the, like, it's taken me three and a half years to yes. get to where I am, th- right. longer, almost four years to get to where I am. Um, but at seven months, pregnant with my son, I had things that I know that I did not want intervention-wise, but there were still things that I know I needed to check up on and follow because my intuitive nature, I wasn't fully connected yet. There you go. Space. Yeah. Right, yeah, so... so it, Please know intuition is not always a hundred percent. Just like your body is you not have to always a hundred percent. Yeah, you have to like you have to strengthen it. You have to strengthen it. If it's been hurt, you have to heal it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eventually, you'll get to a place where you can really, really just trust. Mm-hmm. Um. And and the last thing after intuition is do nothing. And we've talked about this a lot. And this this doing nothing can give you space in the short term to do nothing in that moment, to not make a decision or schedule something, and then, but you're not doing anything in that moment, and then step back and -hmm. and go through Mm -hmm. the other aspects of brain. But it can also be the do nothing in the long term. Right. To choose, like, the induction piece, I'm going to bring this up. Like, going in for the induction would be doing something. Right. Choosing not to have an induction because there is not a medical reason for it right. is doing nothing. I've had so many families who are like actually in labor. They're in the middle of labor and their labor did not progress as the book said it should. Somehow their body didn't read the book <laughs> and they are being offered tons of interventions. And, and I've had many of them. Just choose to do nothing, meaning just choose to continue to do what they have been doing the the hour previous and the hour previous to that and the hour previous to that. And they feel really good about it and have really good results. Sometimes, sometimes interventions are being offered for other reasons. And we have to remember that. So sometimes doing nothing is, is a good way of just saying, is this intervention being offered for my health and my baby's health? Or is this intervention being offered for something else? Is it being offered for the medical provider's schedule? Is it being offered for the hospital's profit margins? Is it being offered because they need another room to open up? You know, sometimes doing nothing might be in your best interest because that actually is the best thing for you to do for yourself at that moment. Yeah, and and that's just also recognizing are you being – pushed into something or bullied into something that doesn't align with your beliefs or like what it is that you need. Right. And is it in the best interest of someone else too? Um, yeah, I love that piece. When you said profit margins, uh, we look at inductions going up over the holidays. Yes. Um, like Thanksgiving, Christmas, but even think like, okay, well, if someone's due first week of January and they're saying, let's do this before Christmas. <laughs> That's an entirely different fiscal year. Oh, there you go. Or vacation, right? Yeah, vacations, holidays. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what I've always things. thought of. But I didn't think about the fiscal year piece or the yes. month to month piece. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, what is your body being? What is your body being subjected to, and for what reason is it actually for the health of you and the health of your baby? Mm-hmm. Oh, man. You guys, what a great episode. I hope this is helpful for you. And we love having you. 
Um, keep an eye out for the next episode. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet. And until next time.